So today we are continuing our um, spooky drugs, which is just scary, scary, scary stuff. And I presented this, um, the 10 most dangerous commonly used veterinary drugs at the um, Redefining Health Expo, sorry, brain fart, uh, <laughs> in uh, California a couple of weeks ago. And so I did that presentation in about 45 minutes. And so now we're taking those 10 categories of drugs or 10 specific drugs and blowing them out over a 10 day period and taking a deeper dive into the side effects, the problems with them, how they're prescribed, that sort of thing. Oh, good morning, New Zealand. Um, and, uh, and then looking at alternatives to these drugs because it's really scary. And um, tomorrow, uh, Hugh and I are driving to Atlanta, Georgia, and we are going to see our friends at All Provide. And the drug that we are talking about tomorrow, we have a personal story to go with. And it's going to be very sad. Um, and this is why we are trying to raise awareness of um, these problems for everyone so that so that you can make good choices and be well informed about the choices that you're making. So today we want to talk about steroids and steroids come in lots and lots and lots of forms. There's prednisone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, um, Depomedrol. Um, oh, there's another um, injectable one. Uh, and then Vetalog is, uh, and then triamcinolone, budesonide. There's so many different steroids that are used. Um, and they do have their place in medicine. However, they are often used incorrectly and for too long and um, at doses that are too high and cause uh, really wreak havoc with our pets. Um, kitty cats are a little bit more uh, resistant to the side effects of steroids than dogs are, but still long-term use in cats. It's going to cause a lot of the same issues that we see with dogs. So I'm pretty sure that almost um, everybody is familiar with some of the common side effects from steroids, the increased drinking and urination. Most veterinarians are good enough to tell you that, oh, by the way, he's going to drink and pee more so that when he has an accident in your house, you understand that it comes from the drug and that your dog hasn't suddenly developed a new problem or, or lost his mind. I mean, that's a possibility as well. Um, and I want to tell you that the one of my practices was only nine tenths of a mile from a practice that had been in that town for many, many, many years. And Depomedrol is a long acting steroid injection. So it's most commonly used in cats where cats don't like to be medicated once or twice a day with a pill. So commonly, um, and this is really one of the reasons that Depo was made, is that it's a slow release formulation. It's given by injection. Guess what? Cats do like to make cancers where injections are given. So they could make a, a fibrosarcoma from this injection just as well as any other one. Um, but this veterinarian down the street I think he literally used 10 bottles of Depomedrol a day and they're, you know, decent sized bottles, they're multi-dose bottles, but every single set of records that ever came in from his office, the animals were given Depomedrol and given it repeatedly. The problem with Depomedrol is it has its anti-inflammatory effects for about three weeks, two to four, you know, depending on the animal, they all react a little differently, but it suppresses the adrenal glands for months because the body we all make steroids in our body and our animals all make steroids in their body. They're made by the adrenal glands. So yesterday we talked a lot about adrenal glands when we were talking about trilostane, which by the way, some people were really unhappy about that. I gave you the facts about trilostane. If you're using trilostane and it's working for your pet, great, go for it. I just want you to know the facts about what you're given. I'm, I'm not, that there was no opinion in there. Those are the facts <laughs> that are that are out there. And that's what I'm giving you in this series, the facts about these drugs. So um, the our adrenal glands make cortisol and make different steroid hormones in our body. And when you give a steroid, whether it's orally or by injection or topically, it suppresses the adrenal gland because there's that feedback mechanism. The bloodstream detects that there's steroid in the system. So the adrenal gland says, Whoop, I don't have to do that anymore. And it just kind of quits doing its job. So if Depomedrol only 
suppresses symptoms of inflammation or itching, whatever you're using it for, for two to four weeks, but it suppresses the adrenal glands for months. When it stops helping the symptoms, what do you do? Oh, well, now my cat's itching again. You go running back in, you get another injection. Well, we just keep pounding those adrenals and pounding those adrenals and shutting them down. Um, so side effects, increased drinking and urine. So that was a really bad way to practice, by the way. And I said, if anybody ever took away his bottle of Depomedrol, the, the guy would have to close up his doors because he wouldn't know what else to use. It was terrible. Um, so things that we get. Um, besides the increased drinking and urination, which can cause uh, incontinence, we can get increased appetite, definitely, which can cause weight gain and obesity. Gastrointestinal ulceration. Remember a couple days ago when we talked about the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and how they really can cause GI ulceration? Vomiting, diarrhea, and those dark tarry stools or coffee ground vomit. So my aunt and uncle, many, many years ago, had a little tiny Maltese. And one night the dog was, they were watching TV and the dog came running across the living room and tried to jump up into their laps on the sofa. The only problem was the dog misjudged the jump and the dog went head first into the like arm end of the sofa. And when it fell down, it couldn't walk. So they brought the dog in to me and I was like, oh, geez, we really messed something up here. So I put the dog on steroids. It's a little tiny five pound dog. So maybe 10. Um, and I put her on steroids because she wasn't walking. We had spinal cord trauma. Um, they couldn't afford to go get an MRI and all that kind of stuff. So I was like, all right, well, we'll give this a try. And this was very, very early in my holistic career. So not a whole lot of tools in my toolbox. So within a week, the dog started vomiting, vomiting blood, vomiting coffee grounds, pooping out tarry stools. And I went, oh no, this dog has ulcerated and she cannot take any more steroids. We have to stop this. Dog still wasn't walking. Now, this is one of those interesting times when I'm like, okay, I'm between a rock and a hard place. And I had the dog in the back of the clinic and I thought, all right, I don't have anything to lose here. And I did a chiropractic adjustment on the dog. And it was one of those miracle moments where you go, oh my gosh, because after I did the adjustment, the dog gave a shake and then ran across the room like she had never had an injury. I was like, wow, I should have done that on day one instead of the steroids. However, I was very new to it. The biggest problem that I had at that point was I had to go tell my aunt and uncle what I had done because I didn't do it in front of them. Uh, obviously, they were thrilled because the dog was now running and playing and, and acting great. Um, but I was like, well, I did a chiropractic adjustment on your dog. And remember, this was so early in my, and chiropractic was the first thing that I learned. And they're like, well, why didn't you do that last week? I said, because I thought you'd think I was a nut. <laughs> anyway, so we got the dog off the steroids and the dog recovered and everything did well. Um, but, you know, that's why we look for alternative therapies. All right. So uh, in addition to the gastrointestinal ulceration, vomiting, diarrhea, tarry stools, we can get pancreatitis. These dogs that are on steroids are much more prone to pancreatitis. They are um, prone to uh, dogs and cats. Uh, they're prone to increased blood pressure. Steroids can cause that because they affect the kidneys ability to retain salt as in they make the kidneys retain more salt. So obviously that's gonna be a problem for animals with heart disease as well. So we never, or very, very, very rarely, it's, good, it's gotta be like a, a big emergency to use a steroid in a dog who's on heart medications or who has heart disease. Um, let's see, we can get muscle weakness and thinning of the skin, poor hair coat, blackheads, and calcinosis cutis, which are uh, calcium deposits on the back. We see that in dogs with Cushing's disease because, oh yeah, when you give too many steroids over a long period of time, you have all the symptoms of Cushing's disease because we have too much steroid, which is what Cushing's disease is. That's the body producing too many steroids. This is us giving too many steroids. So that's called iatrogenic Cushing's disease, as in I caused that Cushing's disease by giving too much drug and shut down the adrenal gland. So if we just stop the steroid, then we're going to have an Addisonian crisis. So with steroids, if your animal has been on them more than about 10 days, you always have to do a tapering dose. Never just stop your steroids 
blindly and you will cause a huge crash. Um, we can get behavior changes, aggression and panting. I've seen a lot of aggressive animals when given steroids. Um, can cause liver failure, diabetes, and pancreatitis and Cushing's disease. Um, this is an immune suppressant depending on the dose that is given, that is going to determine, to determine how immunosuppressed the animal is. Um, so we can see skin infections, um, UTIs, 30% of patients on long-term steroids actually have UTIs, but they don't have symptoms of a UTI because the steroid is decreasing the inflammation, the cystitis, the inflammation of the bladder, but it's also suppressing the immune system and allowing the bacteria to grow. So your, your animal may not show you that there's any signs of a urinary tract infection, yet 30% of patients that are on long-term steroids have undetected um, urinary infections, bacterial urinary infections. So the only way to, to discover them is to do a culture and sensitivity. And that's how you're, you're going to find them because your animal isn't. So if you have an animal that's on long-term steroids, make sure you're getting that urine checked, look at that pH, see where they are. Um, we can see fungal infections that take over and it will activate viral diseases that cats are harboring. So if you have a cat who's ever had herpes or Khaleesi virus, they sort of, it, they don't really get cured of those viruses. It, it goes sort of in remission. I, I don't really want to use the word remission, but the symptoms go away. They're still harboring the virus, but then when we suppress the immune system or they go through a stress period, that's when it pops out and you get the runny eyes and the sneezing. Um, it will induce labor if given to a pregnant animal. It'll interfere with thyroid tests. It'll cause increased liver enzymes and increased cholesterol. Um, so one of my dogs, um, I'm trying to remember which, I think it was Astro, one of my Dobermans. Um, he's the one who developed granulominous meningoencephalitis. This was back in 1989 because I was eight and a half months pregnant at the time and I was bedridden. So the dog went out in the morning and ran out and boom, right into the side of the car. And I was like, well, that was weird. Why did the dog do that? What we discovered, the dog was blind. He literally had gone blind overnight. So I had to get an appointment with a neurologist and the neurologist diagnosed him with granulominous meningoencephalitis, which is basically an autoimmune disease. And we're seeing more and more of it. And this is remember, this is 1989. I didn't know anything holistic. I was doing everything traditional. We were doing vaccines every year and all the heartworm preventative year round and flea and ticks and all that stuff, feeding really crappy dry kibble. Um, and so when I went to the neurologist, he said, this is probably caused by the distemper vaccine. You could have knocked me over. I was like, really? We get problems secondary to vaccines? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> so that was probably the first clue to me that, man, we better start doing things differently. So my dog never got vaccinated again after that. But he was an 80 pound dog and he was put on 80 milligrams of prednisone a day. Now, as you can imagine, 80 milligrams of prednisone in an 80 pound dog is gonna cause a lot of drinking and urination. So here I am, I'm bedridden and I've got an 80 pound dog who every hour is just flooding, literally incontinent, just flooding urine everywhere. So we had to arrange for someone to come to our house every hour to take the dog out to pee. He was on that dose of medication for a year because I didn't know any better. So for those of you who are saying, oh my gosh, I've been given this forever, I didn't know any better. So, he ended up developing ringworm over his entire body. Now I've got an infant and I've got a dog that's got ringworm from one end to the other. And that's because his immune system was so shut down, he couldn't fight it off. Most, you know, we're all exposed to ringworm all the time. Our animals are exposed to ringworm outside all the time. They don't get it, they don't show it, it's not a problem. Where do we see it? We see it in puppies, really see it in kittens whose immune system is weakened. So when we suppress the immune system, we are opening these animals up to bacterial infections, fungal infections, viral infections. Um, and it just causes, it, it's like this cascade effect. Um, interestingly, when I was looking at um, human studies on steroids for this, 
uh, found that in humans, it causes osteoporosis. I'm sure it does the same thing in dogs if you're using it long term, particularly in older dogs. Um, in young animals, it will stunt their growth. Um, and in humans, it also causes enlarged prostate, particularly in young males, um, where they have lots of testosterone floating around. Um, so I'm sure in our unneutered male animals, we would see the same thing. Nobody ever looks for it. Um, and so you should not use, so this, what are steroids used for? They're used for allergies, autoimmune disease. And when we have autoimmune disease, that's when we're using the higher doses like my dog had. And that's really scary. And I think that we use them. I think we could use much, much, much lower doses and get the same effect that we're looking for without causing such severe side effects. Um, they're used for inflammation. They're used to suppress symptoms. They're used for cancer treatment, lymphoma, mast cell tumor, insulinoma. In the insulinoma, it's used to keep the blood sugar up because it will raise the blood sugar, which is why they can be prone to diabetes. Um, steroids don't cure anything. They stop the symptoms. Um, now, in autoimmune disease, yes, they'll, they'll, they'll help cut off what is going on because we've got an immune system in disarray. It's, it's just gone nuts. It doesn't know what to do anymore. Um, so this, that's kind of where I look at steroids and go, I have an animal with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. I have an animal with um, immune mediated thrombocytopenia. So he's got no platelets. He can't clot. He's going to bleed out. He has no red blood cells because he's killing them all off. Okay. Maybe we need a short-term steroid. We got to get this fire put out, but that doesn't mean like my dog, that the dog stays on that. My dog regained his vision within 24 hours. Did he need to stay on 80 milligrams of prednisone a day for a year? Absolutely not. If I had known any better, and bless his heart, he never developed GI ulceration. Um, but you know, if I if I were to go back and do that again, I might have given him a one-time high dose, and then that dose would have been cut down so fast because he regained vision. The inflammation went down. Uh, steroids cannot be used with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories cannot be used with aspirin, should not be used with Lasix or furosemide. So all those heart dogs, here's another reason, because of potassium depletion, it'll drop their potassium right down. Um, should not be used with diabetics, should not be used with heart disease, should not be used in pregnancy because it'll induce labor, should not be used in an animal who has an infection, fungal, bacterial, or viral. Well, how many times are we using steroids when they've got pyoderma, skin infection, and pustules all over the place, and you go home with your steroids and your antibiotics? Well, we're just saying, come on, super infection, come on down and jump on board. It's a big problem. Uh, should not be given to dogs with Cushing's disease. They already have too much steroid in their body. Should not be given in any animals that have any kind of GI ulceration. Um, so animals with kidney disease who have a high BUN and may have some ulceration, absolutely, you don't want to give a steroid on top of that. Um, and you don't want to use it in growing young dogs because it will stunt their growth. I didn't find anything about cats with that, but I would think if you gave it to young cats, you could uh, have the same issues. All right. Let me go back and see about some of these. Your dog developed blood clots related to prednisone. Yep. Uh, so Cushing's dogs, we know they are thrown to, uh, prone to throw clots, um, and that's high steroids. So they could develop um, uh, blood clots and high blood pressure as well. Um, your boy got immune-mediated thrombocytopenia from his distemper booster. There you go. Uh, lost 12 pounds, all his muscles. Yeah, so when that's a, uh, when we talk about muscle atrophy, I had a dog who had um, aplastic anemia, so couldn't make any red blood cells. Bone marrow just stopped. Dog was at the university on really high doses of steroids, uh, cyclosporin, um, and had had three blood transfusions and was not responding at all. And the university said, it's dead dog, nothing more we can do. And the owner said, I'm not buying that came to me, we did acupuncture, we did herbs, and we did diet therapy. Dog rebounded beautifully, took her off all the drugs. But when she came to me, she had no muscles left on her head. She had complete atrophy, so she had this skull with skin on it. And by getting her off the drugs, um, you know, obviously we had to wean her down a little bit because she had been on so much. Uh, but she responded beautifully to therapy, and she did develop all of her head muscles back again once the steroids, you know, were out of her body, and she got rid of all the Cushingoid symptoms. Um, all right. So, I, it, of course, Facebook is not letting me see 
um, stuff that's been going by. Um, your dog happened to your dog as well. A variety of predisposing risk factors, but Pred was destroying him. And he got a pulmonary embolism and somehow lived. Yeah, now he's doomed to a life of blood thinners. So the question with that is, is he really? Like, he had the pulmonary embolism. Um, you know, is he still at risk for doing that again? Because if not, um, you know, maybe you'd be able to wean him off that. I would definitely talk to the vet about that. Your dog has um, B2 mitral valve disease, collapsed trachea, no water on the lungs, but he's been coughing a lot on the leash to the vet, put him on prednisone, but he's also started on a small dose of Lasix. I would find something else to use. Um, I, I think that's a bad combination for your dog with mitral valve disease. Um, there are, there are many other things that can be used for that cough. A lot of people use Hycodan. Um, does this include eye meds with steroids in them? Um, you'd have to use a lot to, to get them to absorb enough, um, to cause an issue, but steroids should not be used long-term in the eyes Anyway, in my opinion, anyway, dog's personality changed completely. He didn't become aggressive, but he was afraid of our other dog was merely a shell of his usual self. Yeah, definitely. That recommended a monthly dose of medroxyprogesterone acetate for behavioral issues and then promptly suggested we put the dog to sleep. Trainers are also recommending medicating dogs, which is why I just visited the vet. Obviously, I ignored them. Good for you. Yeah, that's another one of those long acting things. Um, don't recommend it. Um why do most vets not think that PRED can cause liver failure? They recognize it can cause elevated enzymes, uh, but not the cause of the elevated bilirubin and actual liver failure. Well, it's definitely causes swelling in the liver. Um, so, and it's suppressing the immune system, you know, definitely associated with liver disease. Um, dog is on Temeral P half once a day. We'll be on it long term. Uh, the thing with, uh, he did very well on Mucinex, go back to that. Um, so Temeral P is a very low dose of Pred. I don't know how big your dog is, but uh, Temeral P is only two milligrams <coughs> of prednisone. So with a half a tablet once a day, you're giving one milligram, um, which is pretty low dose, but I would try not to be giving it. I would at least try to get to every other day or every three days to give the adrenal glands a chance to rebound in between. Um, does it suppress the immune system even if vaccinated? Yes. And if they're on a high dose of steroids and you vaccinate them while they're on that high dose, they're not going to have a good response to their vaccine. So not recommended to vaccinate while on steroids. Uh, will the fungal infections subside after stopping prednisone? Yeah, I think with my dog, um, we did it just with uh, shampoos. I did not put him on, you know, because here's the problem. You're, you're treating a dog with high dose of steroids and now you've got secondary bacterial infections, secondary fungal infection. You've got all these other things going on. So now your veterinarian says, okay, well now we're going to put him on ketoconazole for his fungal infection and we're going to put him on antibiotic for his bacterial infection. And it's kind of like what we talked about with everything else. You're using so many drugs to treat the side effects of the other drugs. And it's better to solve the problem. So when we're using these for allergies, they're suppressing the symptoms. They're not curing the allergies. You still have to work on the allergy problem. When we're using it for cancers like lymphoma, you know, that's a that's a tough box to be in because we know that that steroids work pretty darn well for certain cancers. Unfortunately, they also have really severe side effects and at some point the animal will become, the cancer will become resistant to that steroid and upping the dose doesn't help. Um, so when they reach that brick wall of, I'm not responding to that steroid anymore, they're not gonna respond to the steroid no matter what. So, um, okay. As soon as we stop prednisone, Sasha May's mediastinal mass return. So that's a kitty cat uh, and that is really common. Um, and that if it's mediastinal, very good chance it's a lymphoma. Um, now the question is, what did you return to steroids and did the mass shrink again? Because a lot of times if you stop and then restart, it won't respond. Um, okay. So inhaled steroids, uh, for chronic bronchitis, interestingly, inhaled steroids have less side effects, but I did have a client whose cat was on, um, an inhaler. And she was using it three times a day for his asthma. And again, it was not curing the problem. We weren't addressing the, the you know, new client to me, not addressing the underlying problem that was causing the asthma. 
um, just literally kept throwing more steroids at it. The cat ended up bald, completely bald. I'd never seen this before. Um, completely bald from all the steroids. Like it had all of the symptoms of a dog with Cushing's disease. It had bald skin, muscle wasting, thin skin, um, calcium deposits on the, I think it was terrible. Um, and so we ended up getting the dog, the cat on, you know, dietary therapy, herbal therapy, acupuncture, cleaned up things in the environment that were affecting the cat, like chemicals that were being used, that sort of thing. Um, Oh my gosh, your dog's been on prednisone for nine years due to autoimmune. If I take her off, she gets hives, abscesses, blisters on her tongue. Um, yeah, so I'm hoping you're on a really, now she has laryngeal paralysis and immune mediator arthritis. She's an immune mess. She's been a mess since she was six months old. Yeah, I, that's not, you know, been on for nine years. I wouldn't be stopping at this point because she'll fall apart. Um which is bad. You did stem cell therapy and it didn't touch her arthritis. Yeah. Um, so what is considered a low dose? Well, the higher doses that are used for autoimmune disease are like a milligram per pound per day. So that was my Doberman was on 80 milligrams for an 80 pound dog. That's a lot. So, you know, I want to get them down like a physiologic dose of prednisone, let's say you have a dog with Addison's disease and you need to replace the amount of steroid in the body. I had a patient that was a 50-ish 50, 50 pound boxer that had Addison's disease and her physiologic dose was about two and a half milligrams a day. So that's what's, you know, that's a very, very, very tiny, that's like 0.05 milligrams per pound of body weight is what the dog actually needs. Um, so you want to go as low as possible. Now, when you're you're dealing with the cancers, they're going to use slight, they're not going to use those autoimmune doses, but they're going to use higher doses. And in kitty cats, they tend to use higher doses because um, they are more resistant to the side effects. Um, and for lymphoma kitties, they do really well with PRED. So Linda, I had a cat with um, lymph lymphoma. It started in his throat. Eventually it went to his kidneys, but he was on prednisone for a year. Uh, he was not able to eat because it was in his throat. We had a feeding tube put in, started him on prednisone and started him on Tagamet, I think. Uh, and within a couple of days, he was eating. Within 30 days, his stomach tube fell out on its own. I think I only used it for you know a few days. Um, and he lived for another year. And then his lymphoma, I went away on a trip and we had a pet sitter, very nice pet sitter, but it was not mama. And in that two week period that I was away, that was stressful for the cat. And when I came home, his lymphoma had spread to his kidneys. His kidneys were basketballs. I mean, they were just huge. Um, and he stopped eating. So stress is uh, for these animals with cancer and immune problems. Stress is a, a big deal for them. Not after your dog started, not long after your dog started steroids, you got vestibular syndrome every few months, thankfully only lasting three days and no lasting effects. Yeah, I mean, that may or may not be related to the steroids because we don't know what really causes that. Could it be a blood clot that formed? Sure. Um, we don't really know what causes vestibular syndrome in dogs, and it usually does only last a few days. Uh, first thing the vets in Ireland give when there's any type of infection is steroids. Now, does that make any sense at all? It's an infection infection. We want the immune system to attack it. Oh no, we'll give steroids and suppress the immune system. That makes no sense at all. Now, if you have horrible inflammation, somebody, when we posted this, somebody said that their dog's ears blew up. They were bright red, really thick because of all the swelling. So they had to give a steroid. That's what a steroid is for, but it's for short-term use. Steroids were never meant to be used for a lifetime. They're not meant to be used indiscriminately at high doses. They're meant to be used kind of, all right, we got to put the brakes on here. Let's stop this reaction that's happening. All right, good. We're 48 hours in, the reaction's good. Now, let's fix the underlying problem. And this is where traditional medicine and holistic medicine go, Bleh! because traditional medicine, you're going to end up with higher doses of steroids for a much longer 
period of time. With holistic medicine, if you have a homeopathic veterinarian, they're going to give you homeopathic remedies. If you have a TCBM veterinarian, they may want to go with acupuncture and herbs. Um, if you have an integrated veterinarian, maybe they're going to say, okay, I'm going to use steroids for a day or two just to get things under control, but we got to fix this underlying problem, whether that's the diet, whether that's the over-vaccination, whether that's the confused immune system. Um, there's a lot of different things that that need to be done. And so the big problem is, um, you know, not wanting to fix the underlying problem. Your dog was put on prednisone to treat inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah, horrible. You got to get them off of that. You got to fix the diet. You got to fix the leaky gut. Um, and then if they do have to stay on something for any length of time, you should switch to budesonide, which is um, much less side effects because uh, it treats the inside of the bowel um, without causing everything else to go crazy. Uh, uh, great. Dog on high doses of heart meds for congestive heart failure. The specialist added steroids for the collapsing trachea is gone three days later. Yeah. And they know better. They know that steroids are a problem. Um, your dog has severe IBD. She's on a milligram per kilogram of pred. So it's a half milligram per pound. Tried to taper. Uh, and you've tried to adapt her diet, but it's such a difficult disease. You have got to fix the diet. If that dog is is going to have so much trouble with that dose of prednisone. That diet and the leaky gut have got to get fixed. So try to find a holistic uh, doc that you can work with. Um, because in traditional medicine, they're just going to pile more drugs on there. Dog with mast cell tumors. Uh, surgery leads to more popping up. It was suggested to do low dose prednisone if it... Uh, if the MCTs respond for a period of time, I'd do a very short period of time. Um, Cause again, you're suppressing the immune system and sometimes suppressing the immune system. The immune system is not scavenging after the mast cells. We do have, I do have a blog on mast cell tumors with natural therapies for that. Um, so I would recommend that you look at that. Um, all right, so your dog was put on prednisone to treat IBD, tapered. He's now on one milligram. Well, I don't know how big the dog is. Um, how do you recommend we stop completely? You go to every other day <coughs> and see how the dog does. Um, somebody said their dog was on a uh, really low dose every third day. I'm like, well, the adrenal glands get to come back to normal, um, you know, and, and keep functioning when you can get down to that dose. So... Uh. All right, your Proxicam on the nasal tumor, no biopsy result yet. Does being on extended use cause issues with the Proxicam? If the dog handles it, the dog's going to handle it. If he doesn't handle it, he's not going to handle it. Um, what is an alternative to prednisone to treat and manage IBD for dogs? Fix the leaky gut. Fix the immune system. Find the right diet for the dog. Um, use natural alternatives. I mean, there's so many natural anti-inflammatories, the PEA, uh, plant-based sterols, uh, so many other things, but really it's about fixing that leaky gut and fixing uh, the diet. Um, there you go. There's somebody whose dog was put on prednisone for the collapsed trachea and he had behavior issues associated with it. So now he takes the and hydrocodone and his inhalant. Not perfect, but um, kind of less problems there. Um, discuss steroids in conjunction with chemo protocols. Even integrated vets use prednisone. Yeah, for lymphoma, um, prednisone is kind of a mainstay for that. Uh, so I... Most, even holistic veterinarians, we use, I used prednisone uh, for lymphoma, particularly for my patients who um, didn't want to have chemotherapy just to get the swelling down in those lymph nodes, make them so they could eat and breathe better. Um, and then again, you're working on getting the, the body to heal. Um, Let's see. Those of you who have dogs with trachea issues, pet well-being, lung gold. Yeah, I had I used that for a couple tr um, Yorkies that had uh, collapsing trachea issues. So uh, even trying every other day is mass returned. Yeah, it's a cat, Linda. He's going to be a lot more resistant to um, the side effects. Just monitor him very closely for diabetes. That would be the big thing. Uh, Tagamet Benadryl protocol is fine for mast cell. 
Um, again, I, I would put them on something like that short term in my practice because we use diet and herbs and other things to get them under control. Um, all right, your girl, nine pounds, started pred today, five milligrams. Oh, geez. Really bad IBD, tried raw food, didn't work. She's had bad anxiety, which makes the, yeah, trying CBD for that. So I do have, I think I have a blog on IBD that talks about um, the different things that cause it, or I might be thinking of my pancreatitis blog that talks about for herbs. Um, what do you recommend for cats when stress is high and they are, affected with asthma and on depot antibiotics. Ugh, terrible. So I would be doing something to decrease the stress like CBD or, uh, yeah, I would do CBD treats for the cat. Um, and man, I would not use depot, but I know it's hard to, to dose them every day. And I don't know why with asthma, the cat is on antibiotics. Um, all right. Oh, steroids webinar. Thank you. Um, all right. Let me go over here. Cat on prednisolone, two and a half milligrams a day for allergy, uh, related allergies. I've tried weaning her off, but coughing continues. She's on a raw diet. Is there anything else I can do? Yes. Um, so you've, you've got, um, it's basically a lung problem. Uh, it's a lung yin deficiency usually that causes these chronic coughs. Um, I used herbs for it. I was able to get almost all of my asthmatic cats off medications by using herbal formulas and a very high moisture diet. So she's on a raw diet, which is great. Um, uh, instead of prednisone for IBD, use budesonide. Yeah. Um, okay. So what do I do with dogs that have uh, Plechner's and have low cortisol and adrenals? Well, if you're gonna re replace cortisol, you're going to be using um, um, physiologic dosing, not pharmacologic dosing. Uh, but I might look at trying to use um, plant sterols or something more natural than, um, than using steroids that are gonna have big side effects. How do you wean off? Really struggle to get all the products. Can MVD dogs use low modal for the trachea cough? I've seen that used and I was not aware of that when I was in practice, but lately I've been seeing uh, seeing them use that. And if you're using steroids, again, you have to do the slow wean. So let's say you're giving five milligrams twice a day. Whatever, I would hope that would be a bigger dog. But let's say you're giving five milligrams twice a day. The first thing you wanna do is go to five milligrams once a day and do that depending on how long the animal's been on it, but do that for five to seven days. If they do okay on that, then you go down to two and a half milligrams, so a half a tablet once a day for five to seven days. And then you try going to every other day for five to seven days and go to every third day. And if the symptoms aren't getting worse and the animal is doing well and they seem to be responding and you're getting rid of that increased drinking, urination, lethargy, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you get down to every third day and they're doing well, you're probably okay to stop. But that's gonna be about a three week period to get from where you were to where you wanna be. The higher the doses that they're on, the longer it's gonna take to do that process.